Since the war in Gaza started, many people have worried about it sparking a much larger regional conflict. While that has not happened, at least not yet, other armed actors are being drawn in. So what does this escalation mean and where will it end? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Strikes by Yemen-based Houthi fighters on international shipping in the Red Sea have prompted a US-led coalition to attack the Iran-backed group. It's a complicated picture of political alliances and proxy wars, all underpinned by the suffering in Gaza. Before and after images following US and British airstrikes on strategic targets in Yemen. These are retaliation for Houthi attacks on ships in the Red Sea. The Yemeni Houthi armed forces continue to carry out their military operations and to impose a decision banning Israeli navigation in the Arabian Sea and Red Sea until the aggression on the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip ceases and the siege is lifted. A coalition led by the US warned that ongoing Houthi attacks in the Red Sea are illegal, unacceptable and profoundly destabilizing adding the Houthis will bear the responsibility of the consequences should they continue to threaten lives, the global economy, and the free flow of commerce in the region's critical waterways. January 11th saw the first strike on Yemeni soil, targeting Houthi military facilities. I say this, it's important that no one takes away that this house believes on any side that there is a linkage between direct action and self-defense against the Houthis and the situation in Israel-Gaza. They are entirely distinct. For the West, it's not about Gaza. Around 15% of global shipping containers travel through the Red Sea. Following the Houthi attacks, many companies have diverted their cargo ships around Africa, adding nine days to the journey at a significant cost. The Houthis are the latest Iran-funded group to join the conflict. Hamas in Gaza ignited the current round of fighting when it attacked Israel on October 7th. Hezbollah in Lebanon has been firing rockets into Israel's territory with more frequency since then. America's involvement appears to have galvanized the Houthis' popularity and resolve. President Biden has admitted airstrikes won't stop the group. Are the airstrikes in Yemen working? Well, when you say working, are they stopping the Houthis? No. Are they going to continue? Yes. So how far will the U.S. be drawn in, and for how long can Iran bankroll the fighting? Let's meet our guests. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Elizabeth Braw. She's a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Transatlantic Security Initiative. Mohammed Morandi is an Iranian-American academic and political analyst. He joins us from Tehran. And here with me in the studio is Dr. Martin Smith. He's a senior lecturer in defense and international affairs at the Royal Military Academy that's at Sandhurst. Mohammed, I'll come to you first. Antonio Gutierrez, the UN Secretary General, said recently that the Middle East right now is a tinderbox. How close do you feel we are getting to it sparking even further into a, a bigger escalation? It's quite possible. We already see the United States escalating in the Red Sea, and many believe that the Israeli regime will escalate in Lebanon. And if there's escalation in Lebanon, then we're going to see escalation in Iraq, and uh, things will gradually become even more difficult to manage for those who want to end the bloodshed. Elizabeth, the pace of the escalation right now seems to be mercifully slow. The escalation, you know, we're seeing increments, but there has been no massive step up. I guess we should be very grateful for small mercies. In the scheme of things, yes, we, we should be grateful. I think that the thing to remember here is, is the incredibly difficult position that, that Western countries are in. Uh, somebody needs to protect global shipping, and uh, it's not going to be China or Russia, is it? So it's, it's got to be Western countries, uh, and uh, that's what they are trying to do. They try to do it first through Prosperity Guardian, which is a, a defensive mission, and then uh, the US and the UK and, and a few, a very small number of other countries form this coalition that uh, is uh, 
conducting the strikes uh, against the Houthis. Um, and uh, that is not terribly successful either. And it was sort of an in incremental escalation. But uh, they are not doing it for any purpose other than to, to protect global shipping. But I think it's, it's easy to see it as, as some sort of entry into um, into the Israel Gaza conflict, and certainly the Houthis are are uh, describing it as such. And and uh, the, the victims of all of this are are global consumers, global companies, and obviously the shipping companies, including their crews uh, that now face uh, really perilous journeys through the Red Sea through no fault of their own. And Elizabeth, of course, victims include the Yemeni people. Let's not forget. That is true, uh, but I think there, so. There are two separate things going on here. Uh, there is the Israel Gaza conflict on one hand, and the global shipping uh, situation in the Red Sea on the other hand, uh, which has now escalated to the point where uh, where the U.S. and, and the U.K. are striking uh, Yemeni targets. Uh, of course, uh, there would be no no need to strike these Yemeni targets if the Houthis hadn't discovered that they that they could gain global. Uh, global fame or or, uh, or or notoriety by attacking global shipping. And I think this is what makes this so different from from uh, from pirates, for example. They are not. They don't represent any sort of state. They are just out to get money uh, by taking uh, commercial merchant vessels. The Houthis are doing it for geopolitical reasons. It doesn't matter whether they manage to 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 strike a vessel or seize a vessel. They get that global attention anyway. Well, let's take a look while we're talking about the Houthis. Just who are they? The Houthis are an armed group that control most parts of Yemen, including the capital Sana'a, and some of the western and northern areas close to Saudi Arabia. The Houthis emerged in the 1990s, but really rose to prominence in 2014, when the group rebelled against Yemen's government, causing it to step down and sparking a crippling humanitarian crisis. And they then spent almost a decade with I Iran's backing uh, fighting a war. Um, Martin, how dangerous do you believe the Houthis are right now? I think in terms of um, uh, being able to, as Elizabeth would say, um, pose a significant and ongoing threat to a key global shipping route, uh, then they are a significant factor. And I think, following on from what we just said there, Ender, as well, uh, the Houthis are not going away. Uh, they are uh, essentially um, a tribal group. They're a cultural um, group um, led by the Al Houthi clan, which means that they're deeply embedded and entrenched in Yemeni society. They're not an outside bunch of militant uh, radicals. So the Houthis are um, an increasingly significant factor and they're a permanent factor. So in terms of American and British strategy, um, I suspect that in the corridors of power in Washington and London, there isn't that much of an expectation that the current round of airstrikes is going to be able to um, silence the Houthis uh, for good. Essentially, it's uh, partly a deterrence mission to try to prevent them from escalating any further by using more significant or destructive missiles, for example, and partly a containment and reassurance mission as well, so that the key global shipping routes affected are not completely uh, um, gummed up by the threat of Houthi action. Do you feel the American and British governments were right, therefore, to target the Houthis and start dismantling their infrastructure? I don't think they had any choice because, as Elizabeth was saying, who else is going to do anything? Uh, China and Russia certainly aren't. The UN uh, is not capable. There's no regional organisation in the Middle East without the capacity or the willingness, frankly, to be able to step up uh, and do anything. So I think it was a, uh, a no-win situation from an American and British point of view. The situation couldn't be allowed to carry on uh, in terms of the not just the, the, the physical military threat posed, but even more than that, the, the dissuasive impact on global shipping companies. Um, something had to be done and be seen to be done uh, and the US and the UK were probably the only two significant military powers available to do it. Mohammed, the Houthis are one of many proxies in all of this backed by Iran. Just talk us through what you think is Iran's game plan here. What are the Iranians up to? 
Ansarullah, or what Westerners like to call the Houthis, they are not a tribe. They are a political organization that have roots across Yemen. And they overthrew a corrupt foreign-backed government. And they've been uh, in charge of the country. They've been governing the country for a decade. The fact that the United States does not recognize it does not make them illegitimate or does not belittle them. And the crisis that was created in Yemen was because the United States, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Canadians, the British, the French, they all uh, imposed a starvation siege in the Red Sea, and they helped the Saudis bomb the country day and night. Weddings were bombed, school buses were bombed, uh, funerals were bombed. Uh, it was extraordinary what the United States and its allies did for the last uh, nine years, especially uh, seven years um, until the ceasefire. But, but Mohammed, going Allah, back to my question, what, what's Iran's game plan here? Well, the, the whole Ansarullah, or what your colleagues call the Houthis, they are not Iranian proxies. They have agency. They are governing a country. And to claim otherwise, I think, is to misread the situation across the region. It, to say that Hamas is an Iranian proxy, Islamic Jihad is an Iranian proxy, Hezbollah is an Iranian proxy, the Iraqi government, the Syrian government, everyone's an Iranian proxy, then I think uh, that leaves little room for intellectual discovery. But what Ansarullah did was they saw what the Israeli regime was doing to Gaza. They were committing a genocide. They imposed a siege, exactly what the Saudis and their allies did to Yemen. And they said that they're going to block the Israeli port until the genocide stops. They said very specifically that we have nothing to do with international trade, only ships that go to Israeli ports. And they warned ships away. Those ships that ignored them, they struck those ships, but they use light weapons. They could sink ships, but they have not, sinked, they have not sunk a single ship, and no one has been killed so far. But Mohammed, do you accept that the Iranian regime funds all of these groups? I don't even accept the Iran is a regime. If Iran is a regime, then the UK is a regime. Iran supports these groups, every single one of them, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, just like the United States supports the Zionist regime, the Israeli regime, just as the United States allows it to carry out genocide in Gaza, just as the United States has allowed the people of Gaza to be abused and attacked for decades. This did not start on October the 7th as the West likes to pretend it did. In fact, in 2018, this same Hamas, they tried peaceful means. The Great March of Return in 2018 had people walking to the to these uh, walls that the Israeli, the apartheid walls that the Israelis created, and Israeli soldiers would sh gun down people. 240 people were gunned down. They would shoot people in the kneecap. They would bet with one another who could shoot the, the person's knee the easiest or the fastest. They would gun down people two kilometers away and enjoy themselves doing it. 240 people were killed over a few weeks in 2018. The Gaza has been bombed periodically over the years. So the United States supported this. The United States has created this, uh, this helped the Israelis create this uh, death camp that we now see today. Elizabeth, surely a wider war is the last thing Iran wants. Because if it happens, America, Israel, perhaps even the United Kingdom, they will turn their sights on Tehran? I, I don't think uh, anybody wants a, a wider war. And, and this is that's why these uh, attacks uh, in the Red Sea are such a clever strategy. It's it's not military attacks. It's, it's a, a regime uh, that is not internationally recognized. So it would be hard for, for any government to say Yemen is attacking global shipping uh, since they don't uh, recognize this regime. So it's a sort of a, a below the threshold of, of our military violence. This is taking place. And that's why it's so difficult for 
for uh, the country to start trying to do something about it, trying to counter it. That's why it's so hard for them to figure out how to respond. If it were a, a plain old military attack, then it would be completely clear what was to do. Uh, but now that it's 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 short of that, falls short of that, uh, it's, it's totally unclear what can be done, who should do it. And that's why we are in this mess where the Prosperity Guardian mission or um, uh, yeah, Prosperity Guardian mission was launched and then uh, tried to, to, to create some order in the Red Sea and nothing much happened. Now uh, we have seen the next step, which is this uh, strike coalition, and it's not having much effect either. And so I think what we'll see is, is another incremental step, whatever that will be uh, after the, the strikes have been announced if they are not successful, but uh, we're not going to see a massive leap in, in, in the direction of more violence simply because it's not a traditional war and it's in fact not a war yet. Elizabeth, I've seen it reported that what the Houthis are doing is a very effective rebranding, you know, globally seen as a terror group, certainly by the United States. And now they're kind of basically rebranding themselves as a force fighting against American influence in the region. It's been very clever what they've done here, isn't it? It has been very clever, both in terms of, of the actions they have taken and, and uh, the narrative uh, with which they've presented these actions. So uh, until now, we haven't had a situation where there's been a sustained campaign against global shipping uh, by anybody other than uh, pirates uh, of the, the uh, Horn of Africa. And that was, uh, that was different because it was done for commercial reasons and not coordinated. This is coordinated, it's done for geopolitical reasons, and it's extremely effective because you don't need to hit a lot of ships uh, in order for, for the global shipping industry to get extremely nervous and, and uh, governments, as a result, uh, getting extremely nervous as well and the globalised economy getting nervous. Martin, another group we must discuss is Hezbollah. What's the Israeli capacity for waging war on two fronts? We're seeing daily skirmishes between southern Le Lebanon, northern Israel, Hezbollah and the IDF. Well, what do you think might happen there? I think many Israelis uh, will tell you that, as far as they can see, as far as they're concerned, Israel is already at war with Hezbollah. It's at a, so far been at a relatively low level uh, of, uh, of violence and military action. Uh, but the IDF, um, uh, apropos of that, has significant units and significant numbers of personnel deployed along what Israelis uh, refer to as their northern front. So in terms of escalatory uh, potential, obviously nothing is predetermined. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. And I suspect as well that neither Mr Nasrallah, the Hezbollah leader and his advisors, nor Mr Netanyahu actually know uh, what's going to happen. But in terms of potential for escalation, if you consider yourself to already be at war with another party, then conceptually, if you like, the step to ramping things up further is arguably not as significant as it would be if you considered that you had, yes, fraught and um, um, antagonistic, but not warlike relations with that party. So. I'm not saying that there's an in the inevitability of significant military escalation between Israel and Hezbollah, but Israel, number one, is certainly prepared for it and has significant military force in place. And number two, many Israelis regard themselves as being already at war, and so they may see um, that further um, measures of escalation, number one, are inevitable, and number two, from Israel's point of view, it may be better for Israel to initiate and therefore hopefully aim to control the escalation rather than wait to see what Hezbollah are going to do. Thanks, Martin. Mohammed, is this a worst case situation for the Israelis that they end up fighting on two fronts, the war in Gaza and then having to go after Hezbollah? With regards to Hezbollah, the Israeli regime has already lost the war in Gaza, murdering women and children, killing tens of thousands of people. And they've killed tens of thousands of people. 25, 24, 25,000 people are confirmed dead. Thousands are under the rubble. And many thousands, you can be sure, have died of sickness and disease. So this is a genocide that is being broadcast to us live. But the Israeli regime on the battlefield, they've failed to defeat Hamas and Islamic Jihad, a small group in a small ge geographical entity. Do you think that the Israeli regime is going to win a war in Lebanon? 
they already tried that. They invaded Lebanon in 1982 and went all the way to Beirut. They captured Beirut and they helped carry out, carry out a genocide in the Sabra Shatila camp where 3,000 Palestinians were massacred. But that's when Hezbollah came into existence. It came, it came into existence as a result of the occupation. They were a national liberation organization and ultimately in the year 2000, Hezbollah kicked them out of Lebanon. Today, Hezbollah is far stronger than it was back then, and it is definitely far stronger than Hamas or Islamic Jihad. And also, if the Israelis broaden the war, do you think that in Iraq, the resistance groups are going to remain quiet? The United States, the smart thing for the United States to do is to rein in this attack dog, Netanyahu, for the sake of the United States itself. The United States and the West, it, they have sacrificed their soft power for the Israeli regime. But a continuation of this war will lead to a situation where, without a doubt, the West will not win. Elizabeth, just on that point about Benjamin Netanyahu, at what point does Joe Biden make the call and say to him, enough? Uh, I would love to be inside the head of, of Joe Biden because he has... Uh, I think struggled to formulate uh, a workable policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, the uh, Israeli government and Netanyahu in particular, and, and we are seeing uh, global opinion and uh, opinion within the United States and even within Biden's own government shift to people saying, uh, you know, we have to be a bit more forceful and and. Uh, it really comes down to Biden himself, and at what point does he uh, decide for himself that that uh, uh, that maybe the current strategy isn't working? And uh, it, I think it's, it, as I said, I would love to be inside his head. He has been uh, a supporter of of a very vocal supporter of uh, Israel for a very long time, including of Netanyahu, and so it would be uh, a big step for him to. To depart from that uh, that position, but on the other hand, uh, so many uh, people around him and indeed fellow uh, Western leaders are, are advocating for for a change uh, in in policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, in U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel, and we have already seen European countries saying that some something will have to to change. Um, but it really comes down to Biden himself. Thanks, Elizabeth. Martin, I saw a quote this week that when Biden took office, he said to his foreign policy advisors, keep the Middle East off my desk. I mean, it's election year, it's on his desk, and he really needs to take action now, doesn't he? Uh, I think so, and I think he is uh, as far as he's able, because, of course, he's caught in the horns of a dilemma. He's got all these pressures, including some from within the Democratic Party, uh, to be more, to exert himself more and to really begin to exert significant pressure on Mitin Netanyahu uh, to cease and desist from military operations uh, in Gaza. And yet on the other side, of course, there's the really deeply entrenched and durable uh, US Israeli relationship which exists at multiple levels. It exists politically, militarily, culturally, and socially uh, as well. So I think I probably disagree slightly with Elizabeth in the sense that I'm not sure we're going to see, if you like, an inflection point. Uh, in other words, there comes a day when Joe Biden gets on the phone to Mr. Netanyahu and says, look, um, you've achieved all you're going to achieve. This is looking bad for both Israel and the United States. and It's damaging our reputation and our soft power, as Mohammed pointed out. Now you've got to, to cease and desist. I think it's more of a question of over a period of time trying to influence from the outside the Israeli government by putting in place the elements of an acceptable settlement plan, which I think the United States is doing. So you've got the core elements of a two-state solution uh, for the Palestinians somewhere down the road in exchange for normalization of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia in particular, and Hamas agreeing to the release of all the hostages. And a lot of the, the impetus, those ideas, they're not coming from um, within the Netanyahu government. They're actually being generated from within the Biden administration. Thanks, Martin. Mohammed, my final question goes to you. At some point, Perhaps 12 months from now, there could be President Donald J. Trump back in the White House. What would a Trump 2.0 presidency mean for the Middle East region and all of these conflicts? 
it doesn't really make much of a difference. The United States, as things are moving forward, is in a very difficult situation. It has multiple crises across the world. We still have the war going on in Ukraine, which is bound to get worse in the coming months. The United States has severe economic problems. This is going to be a very challenging year. And I think that the U.S. elections will create tensions within the country that uh, perhaps are, will be more problematic than during the first Trump years. But at the end of the day, regardless of whether it's Trump or Biden, people are going to remember across the gro globe what happened in Gaza. And for decades to come, the United States and the Europeans will not be able to tell the Russians that you're violating human rights. They will not be able to tell the Chinese that you're violating human rights because the world is watching what's happening in Gaza and they see that this genocide is unfolding in front of their eyes with the full support of the White House. Mohammed, Elizabeth and Martin Smith, thank you all for your time today. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for Roundtable TRT World. And if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button. But for now, from me and Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.